This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, quote, During the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they're in that condition which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. Thus Thomas Hobbes, the great 17th century natural philosopher who was principally interested in political theory. For Hobbes, the difference between order and disorder was stark. In the state of nature, ungoverned man lived a life in continual fear and danger of violent death. The only way out, he argued, was to submit yourself to one all-powerful absolute sovereign. Hobbes' proposals contained in his controversial and now classic text, The Leviathan, was written just as England was readjusting to life after the Civil War, the execution of the King and the rule of Oliver Cromwell. Why did so many of Hobbes' ideas run counter to the prevailing demands for constitutionalism with a limited monarchy? And why is he regarded by so many political philosophers as radical and important today? With me to discuss the life and work of Thomas Hobbes are Quentin Skinner, Regis Professor of History at the University of Cambridge, David Wooden, Professor of History at the University of York, and Annabel Brett, Senior Lecturer in Political Thought and Intellectual History at Cambridge University. Quentin Skinner, the character of Hobbes' theories was essentially absolutist. Can you give us an overview of his political theory? Yes, well, there are four texts. Uh, The first is the Elements of Law, which he circulates at the time of the resummoning of Parliament in 1640. Half of that is a psychology, the second half is a politics. And then he translates that into Latin and publishes it in 1642, that's the De Kive. The, the third text is Leviathan, published in 1651, and then much later he translates that himself into Latin. The theory undergoes extremely interesting variations, but I suppose that the absolutely fundamental point he wants to make is that it is always rational to give up all your rights to one sovereign, whether that be a natural person or a body of persons. And the celebrated account of the state of nature is intended to show you why it is rational to give up all your rights, because as you indicated in the opening quotation, the alternative to not doing so is war. Can you give us some idea of how he developed into such a a powerful thinker? He's a Catch so that people know what we're talking about, his early life, the university and so on. Yes. Well, he comes from a relatively poor family in the West Country. His father's an illiterate, alcoholic clergyman. Um, But he has a rich uncle who sends him to Oxford. He's a second son, so I guess he's intended for the church, which is quite a thought. Um, And he graduates from Oxford in uh, 1608 not going into the church, but another very well-worn path of the time, he immediately joins a noble household. It's a rather strange story. Um, Lord Hardwick was looking for a tutor for his son, who, uh, Lord Hardwick, who became the first Earl of Devonshire in 1618. His son is 18, but he's just got married, and, of course, that debars him from being an undergraduate. So his father wants a tutor and writes to Hobbes's college, and they recommend Hobbes. Uh, That's in itself very strange, because Hobbes is only three years older than the boy, but apparently, according to John Aubrey, Hobbes' first biographer, uh, the young Sprig had said that he did not want a grave doctor, he wanted someone his own age. And um, Hobbes is appointed, fresh out of Oxford, and effectively stays, as he calls himself, a servant in the Devonshire household for the rest of his incredibly long life, that's to say, for nearly 70 years. It is an extraordinary story, isn't it? I mean, he's a yes. sort of tutor in residence with great independence. Yes. Um, often at odds with the, uh, with the family he was a servant to, as he put it himself. Absolutely. Yeah. David Wooden, during the 1620s, Hobbes undertook uh, an extraordinary linguistic task, which was to translate Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Why was that so difficult, and why do you think he did it? Well, I think why he does it, he tells us later that the reason he does it is that he wants to understand democracy. And Thucydides has written about the democracy of ancient Athens. And it's at a moment when Parliament is trying to assert authority against the king. And so Hobbes, I think, thinks that there is a a move towards something he would call democracy in England, and he's very much opposed to it. And he thinks Thucydides is opposed to democracy, and he turns to him for that. The other reason, I think, for reading Thucydides and translating him is that Thucydides is a, a brilliant student of power politics and of international relations. And Hobbes, when he comes to 
present his theory of the state of nature, says that the standard situation in which you can actually see people in the state of nature is to see one state dealing with another state. And I think if you read Thucydides, what you see is vicious power politics in action, and, and that becomes the model for Hobbes of what the state of nature is. Was he attracted to Thucydides? Because Thucydides seemed to show that democracies are always chaotic, and did that idea uh, underpin the next great work, again referred to by Quentin, the, um, the elements of law, the De Kive? I think that's right. I mean, as far as Hobbes is concerned, what matters is that there should be a supreme authority whose word is law, effectively. Now, in principle, that could be a democracy. The problem with democracies is they're very bad at reaching decisions, and they keep changing their mind. So that in that sense, Hobbes prefers to have one person in charge. So he didn't trust humans uh, as a group, did he? he his, his views of them are, th are fairly savage, as uh, everybody knows. The only quotation I think that everybody knows from a philosopher is that life is a solitary poor, nasty is British and short. Hobbes thinks in it for theoretical purposes you must assume that people are selfish and that they are only interested in uh, improving their own situation in the world and that this brings them into conflict with other people who are also trying to improve their own situation in the world. And that conflict has no natural limit. So as far as he's concerned, you must assume that everybody is murderous in their intentions towards everybody else. He assumes that we're driven by the pursuit of pleasure and by the attempt to avoid pain. And in that sense, we are machines, and we respond entirely automatically and appetitively to the prospect of increasing pleasure or avoiding pain. Annabel Brett, we've just heard about uh, some uh, ideas uh, that Hobbes had about uh, psychology. In the second part of Elements of Law, he examines how human nature can be subjected to a political discipline. Can you tell us about, uh, tell us something of that? Yes, well, I think that Elements of Law is a really key text because it establishes some crucial lines of argument that I think go through all his political works. Um, and the basic uh, parallelism he wants to draw is between the absolute liberty of an individual in the state of nature and the absolute power of the sovereign to decide in the body politic. So really in order to understand how uh, we make the body politic and we subject ourselves to this absolute will of the sovereign, we have to understand a little bit of the psychology and of the liberty that characterizes the state of nature. So Essentially, that liberty is a liberty to act at will. And as David's just said, Hobbes doesn't think of the will in the way that we would think of the will, really, as some kind of free power to choose between two options. For Hobbes, the will just is the passions or the appetite, specifically the last appetite in deliberation, and therefore it's necessitated. And therefore, to act at will is simply to act upon your, your last appetite or aversion towards a particular course of action. Just to round up this uh, section, if we may, uh, David Wooden, can you just place Hobbes's thought as we come to the outbreak of the Civil War uh, in the context of the impending uh, Civil War? What's important about Hobbes's thought in 1640 is he is an extreme... His, his politics are extreme. He wants to insist that the king has the authority to do whatever he wants. Crucially, for example, all property essentially belongs to the king. The king can tax anybody, any amount, whenever he wants. He needn't go to Parliament for consent... And by pushing that line of argument, Hobbes is setting himself against anyone who wants to claim that royal authority is limited and that subjects have rights. And his politics in that sense is way off the scale uh, of normal political discourse, but it's one that's very attractive to a range of supporters of absolute monarchy. But in 1640, he had to escape to Paris. What was that escape prompted by? Yes, well, he does seem suddenly to panic. Um, the long parliament assembled on the 3rd of November in 1640. Hobbes had circulated the elements of law in May in quite a large number of copies. It's not printed, but it's manuscript printed. And in fact, 12 manuscripts survive, quite a number of them up the road in the British Library. And uh, he therefore fears that the sort of view which, as Dave has rightly said, he's put forward in the elements of law is going to get him into real trouble. And he may not be wrong, because only a week after they met, the Long Parliament announced that it would investigate people who held the view that Parliament was not an essential part of the Constitution. And he writes a letter to Lord Scudamore from Paris saying that the day after he heard that, he just decided to leave. And he takes the first boat out. His trunk has to be sent on after him. Um, he just about scrapes enough money together, and there he stays in Paris from the end of 1640 until he returns to England in 1652. But the irony is, for the greatest of the English political theorists, is that the great work of political theory was written in Paris. <laughs>
Yes, and let's turn to that now, to the, to the Leviathan. Annabel Brett, which he started in 1649, mm. and, and the year in which uh, Charles I was tried mm. and executed. Mm. Uh, he put forward in the Leviathan, one of the things he did, we can dwell on the mm. Leviathan for a while, uh, he put forward what were thought of as fairly radical ideas about morality. Mm. Can you talk to us about what... Can you tell us what those ideas were? Yes, I mean, basically he reduced all being to matter in motion. And therefore, what he was getting rid of was the idea that being is partly constituted by some specific form which has some specific good objectively in its nature. And for the scholastics, um, specifically human form as distinct from uh, animal form was distinguished by these powers of reason and of will. Um, so reason is uh, a natural faculty that you have um, naturally to be able to discern both what is, but also what is naturally and objectively morally good. Um, and Thomas Aquinas referred to that as the light of God's countenance, which is actually signed upon us from the Psalms, um, this natural illumination of our minds, which is reason. And in parallel with that, we have uh, a will which is able to choose this natural moral good which we can discern by reason. And all of these two distinguish us from animals and are part of specifically human nature. Now, what Hobbes says, we've already seen him get rid of the will. The will is simply appetite. Now, what he does, and it comes to the fore in Leviathan, is to get rid of this idea of an objective uh, morality. Um, so for Hobbes, we don't have this natural light within us which enables us to s discern what is naturally morally good for mankind. So is he in effect saying, David Wooten, that there's no objective foundation for goodness? He's absolutely saying that. He's saying good, what is good is what's good for me, and I'm entitled to make any view, take any decision about what good is. Uh, if I say it's good for me, that makes it good. It's to completely eliminate any idea of objective right and wrong, objective uh, good and evil. It's to insist that uh, we create our own good through our experience of pleasure and pain, and nobody can tell us that we're right or wrong about it. And consequently, there is no limit to what we're entitled to do if we think we're pursuing something that's good for us in a state of nature. Was that thought to be subversive at the time? It still sounds well, quite it, subversive it's, now. It's <laughs> outrageous. I mean, let's, let's be clear about this. What makes Hobbes an interesting political theorist or an interesting philosopher in general is that he comes up with outrageous positions, which he argues for so strongly that you have to be impressed by the argument and you have to actually worry greatly about where he's actually wrong. And, and that's what he thinks political philosophy in general should be. He gets his idea of philosophy, we're told, from reading Euclid. And he opens Euclid and he sees a, a, a conclusion and he thinks That's, that must be wrong. And he goes back and he works through the argument and he sees that it has to be right. And his whole idea of philosophy is that you will persuade people to think things that they would not otherwise have thought and you will persuade them in such a way that they see that they can't disagree with you. And you do this by defining your terms so that your terms are clear and perspicuous, as Annabelle said, and then by working through deductions until you get to a conclusion that, as it were, is forced upon people. And so if you follow Hobbes, you'll be forced to accept that there is no such thing as right and wrong other than your own will. There's a famous frontispiece uh, of the Leviathan, uh, Quentin Skinner, which dis depicts an extraordinary image. Could you tell us what that image is and then tell us what it, what it says? Yes. Well, uh, there are two versions of the frontispiece. There's the one that you find in the wonderful presentation copy of Leviathan um, on vellum presented to the man who became King Charles II, uh, which is now in the British Library, and that is a drawing. And then there's the engraving, which is the frontispiece of Leviathan. There's an interesting difference, which is that in the engraving, uh, a large number of small people who make up a monstrous body that rises over the countryside are looking up with their backs to us uh, into the face of this great figure. Um, and uh, some of these are men with hats on, some of them are women, and some are actually carrying babies. That is not the version that Hobbes himself seems to have designed. In the presentation copy of Leviathan, what you see is a lot of faces, rather strangely, looking out at us. But the fundamental idea is the same in both versions, which is that a large number of individuals have in a some way been made into one, um, and that they make one kind of monstrous body. And that answers to what I think to be really the fundamental thought uh, in the politics of Leviathan, which maybe I could try exactly. and say I mean, you, a you, word you, about. 
<laughs> well, uh, where, we, where we've been left by Annabelle and Dave, absolutely rightly, is with these passional figures in a state of nature. And it's very important that the state of nature is a state of individuals. It's crucial to Hobbes's absolutist politics that he has to get away from the idea of the people as a body of people. Because if they're a body of people who are conceived to contract or covenant with a sovereign, then if the people is one party to a, to a contract and the sovereign the other, they can impose terms upon the sovereign and they'll be very stupid not to. Hobbes wants to get away from the thought that any terms can be opposed on sovereigns. And he does that by denying that there's any such thing as the body of the people. There are only individuals. So what is the contract? Well, the contract or covenant can only be, he insists, a contract between each and every one of these individuals that there be a sovereign. So we each agree with each to name a certain person. But the subtlety of the theory, which I think the frontispiece very brilliantly illuminates, is that the act of all of us agreeing with everyone who should be sovereign makes us one because we now have a representative who has one will and one voice and can act. But since we authorize those actions, they are the actions of one person, as he says. So the act of authorizing a representative turns the multitude into one. He says it's the unity of the representer, not the unity of the represented, that maketh the people one. However, you can now ask a new question about the people, which is, what is the name of this person that the multitude turns itself into by the act of agreeing a sovereign? And the answer to that question is the state. That's what the state is. It's a multitude of individuals who have been rendered one by putting themselves under this figure. Well, David, you would take that. another element from the frontispiece that, that Quentin didn't mention, which is that this vast body of Leviathan, which is made up of all the subjects, is standing there towering over the countryside, and he's holding two things in his hands. One is uh, the implements of military power, and the other is the crozier, the implement of religious power. And one of the important features of Hobbes' argument by the time he's presenting it in Leviathan is that he's insisting that the ruler not only controls all power of of compulsion, but that the ruler also, as it were, controls the marketplace in ideas, that the ruler will be able to tell people what to think, that he will control uh, what is preached from the pulpits, he's able to legislate about what people ought to believe. Hobbes would prefer him not to legislate too much because he likes people to have a certain amount of, of, of freedom of argument. He obviously benefits himself from the great freedom under the Cromwellian regime. But in principle, the ruler can legislate for people to believe anything. Where did religion... Huh? Because we're talking about essentially full of religious strife as well as political strife, where did religion find its place in Hobbes' philosophy? Well, uh, when Hobbes starts out, he, he says very little about religion. The peculiar thing that happens in Leviathan is that the book becomes, half of the book is about religion, and he discusses religion at great length. And he's taking advantage of the fact that you can speak very freely under Cromwell's regime. And the religion he presents is a most astonishing religion because, as we've been saying, he's a materialist. He therefore doesn't believe in the soul. He can't believe in angels or demons as spiritual beings. He can't even believe that God is a spiritual being. So he has to construct a religion because he wants to insist that he is religious. He has to construct a religion in which there are no spiritual beings, in which there is no possibility of survival except as a material survival, and in which the whole of the Bible has to be reread in order to eliminate any suggestion that uh, there could be a spiritual existence. And that creates a very peculiar religion indeed. But also with um, his, his, his extreme uh, sensationalism, that's to say the, the origins of all our cognition must in the end be the senses, he's going to have no truck whatever with the idea that we can know anything about God. We can't know anything about God because we can only know... Uh, in a sensory way. So the religion that you end up with is, as Dave is implying, an extremely minimalist one. One thing which I think is important about that is that it is connected, I think, with a theme which isn't always sufficiently stressed in Hobbes, which is the desire to liberate. He wants to liberate people from the fear that they are under when they are under ecclesiastical authorities who frighten them with hell. There's no such place who frighten them with the idea of demons and devils. There's no such beings. 
who frighten them with the idea that there are witches who can do them harm. None of this spiritual world exists, so none of these powers exist. But just as he was charged with, with, with going massively against the grain in 1640 politically, he's open to the charge of heresy now. Oh, yes. It? Especially in, uh, in the protectorate. Yes. Well, the moment when that charge becomes very serious is uh, after the restoration of 1660. Mm. Parliament uh, is in an extremely reactionary mood, uh, religiously speaking. And indeed, in 1666, there is introduced into Parliament a decision to examine certain books for heresy. And Leviathan is um, specifically mentioned. And the danger was that heresy was a capital crime. But Hobbes, although he's a very old man by now, uh, has a characteristically aggressive response to this, which is that he decides to make himself an expert on the law of heresy. <laughs> and he immediately writes a book called The Dialogue Between the Philosopher and the Student of the Common Laws, in which he goes in detail into the history of the English law of heresy. He also writes a history of heresy, and he emerges, very typical of Hobbes, with a definition of what heresy is. That's to say, um, using, as he always does, etymology for definitions, and he determines that what it is to hold a heretical view is simply to hold a minority opinion. And he asks how it could possibly be criminal to hold a minority opinion. Well, we have somebody who was a, a monarchist under Charles I, and then he, 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 he fled to Paris beca because of the uh, increasing uh, limited monarchy views and that ended up with regicide in the Civil War. And he came back and he was very pleased to be under Cromwell, and then Charles II came back. And as luck would have it, he'd been his tutor in Paris for a little while, so he, he just about got through that. All this time, can I just br bring back into play the support he was getting from Ca the Cavendish family? Uh, how, did that, how did that keep operating, David? Well, I think it's... Uh, one of the remarkable things about Hobbes, I think, is that people seem to like him, and because they like him, they put up with opinions that they regard as outrageous. I mean, Bishop Bramall, who attacked him, said that he, he respected and liked the man, but he hated the opinions. And, and his relationship with the Cavendish family, I think, has to be based upon the fact that they have a good deal of personal uh, affection for him because they continue to protect him and they look after him and they care for him uh, and they regard him as part of their, of their extended family, even though his politics are never theirs. And after the Restoration, their politics are, are, are weak politics and they're in favor of limited monarchy. And, and, and yet Hobbes is there continuing to insist that the monarchy should be absolute. And when he writes Behemoth, a, a history of the English Civil War, he effectively complains that Charles II has failed to take his opportunity at the Restoration to establish absolute absolute power and has allowed Parliament back in, which was a great mistake, as it were. That's the implicit story mm. he tells. Now, then, one point you just made earlier, which I, I think we should take up, is this very uh, important fact about the capacity of Hobbes himself to survive different regimes mm. and, as it were, the theory as well, because I think, as you were implying, this has a very strong theoretical grounding in Hobbes, and it's important, I think, in Leviathan to see that that is not a legitimist text, that's not a defence of monarchy. Uh, and Hobbes' theory of political obligation is what we need to say a word about here. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that what's very important uh, after, as you say, the regicide and the abolition, indeed, of the institution of monarchy is, is the government that's thereby been established under the Cromwellian Council of State, is it a lawful government? And, of course, royalists will want to say, well, no, because even if they've executed Charles I, there is a living son, so he must be the king by inherited right, because obligation goes with the right to rule. Um, and others will want to say, well, that may not be the case, but the radicals, the levelers, and parliamentarians will want to say, but this has just been a military putsch. I mean, what's happened is that the army has intervened in politics, and nobody has given their consent. And I think it's very important that in Leviathan, Hobbes says himself at the end that his main aspiration was to see his way around those two arguments. And the argument about conquest, he sees his way around through this, uh, again, back to Dave's adjective, outrageous view of freedom, which is that uh, if you submit to a conqueror for fear of death, you nevertheless submit freely um, because you deliberate that this is better than death, so that's a free act. So you do consent to conquest. But as to the notion that um, this is not legitimate because uh, political obligation has to correlate with right, it's fundamental to Hobbes's Leviathan, and perhaps its most important doctrine, that that is wrong. That the question in politics is always, who is protecting us? And so for Hobbes, the question is, who is protecting you? Well, Charles I definitely isn't. He's dead. His son definitely isn't. He's abroad. Cromwell's Council of State is. There is peace. Taxes are being gathered. Things are settling down. Uh, and as Hobbes says, the end, meaning the motive, 
the end of protection is obedience. David? Well, I think that's one side of the coin, yes. You enter government to be protected, you want peace. But how is it possible for government to protect you? It's possible for government to protect you because government has the power to terrify you. The foundation of Hobbes' political theory is fear. He himself yeah. says that he and fear were born twins. He's born during the Armada invasion. And you can't separate in Hobbes' political theory the capacity of government to protect you from the capacity of government to kill you. And so when Hobbes says that a military dictatorship, which is what Cromwell is effectively establishing, that a military dictatorship is a legitimate form of government, why is it legitimate? Because it's capable of terrifying everybody. And that's what makes it legitimate. And, and, and in that sense, you can understand that what that does is evacuate from politics any notion of a uh, higher principle being based in the political order. You, what you get out of the political order is simply peace and stability if you're lucky enough that the military dictatorship doesn't choose to cart you away. It would seem that authoritarians ever since all over the world can use that as justification, can't they? No? Well, in one sense, but I mean, I, 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 I'm, I would disagree that um, Hobbes' Commonwealth is merely a reign of terror. Um, in Chapter 30, when he's talking about the duties of the, the sovereign representative, he yes. says he must actually inform the subject of the grounds of his sovereign rights because his rights depend on our natural obligation. We have to understand that, to understand our subjection. If we're merely terrorised into subjection and we take the sovereign as our enemy, then it will disintegrate, is the implication. We have to own what he does. Exactly. So I would say that, for one thing. Um, but the other thing I would say about Hobbes and today is that, uh, I mean, on the one hand, he's, he's a useful um, counter to any kind of complacency that the, civ the civility we enjoy is somehow natural and we just have it anyway. It's a very delicate construct for Hobbes. We could lose it at any point. So that's one. And the other way in which I think he's still relevant is to lose this teleology, this inherent superiority of man over nature. And particularly now, I think, with environmental concerns, um, we need to bear that in mind. I'd like to come back on the reign of terror question. I mean, Hobbes' arguments necessarily and, and deliberately contain subtle ambiguities. But the foundation of Hobbes' political thought, I think, as Quentin made clear, is a very peculiar doctrine of consent. If a highwayman comes up to me and says, your money or your life, and I hand over my money, as far as Hobbes is concerned, I've agreed to it. And I've entered into a contract to hand over my money. Most willingly. Most willingly. <laughs> so something done under fear is voluntary. Mm. And in that sense, all our relationships with the sovereign are voluntary, but simultaneously done under, under fear. And so we can be terrorized into consent. And, and where we normally think if we're terrorized, we're not consenting. Hobbes insists that if we're terrorized, we are consenting. That's right. But there is something very important to remember in the politics of 1649, which is when Hobbes is writing Leviathan, uh, which is that the government did ask for um, a loyalty oath. Uh, in October 1649, Parliament demands that people so-called um, so engage. Every male over the age of 18 had to sign, it was all sent round to the parish churches, that uh, they accepted that England was now a republic. So the question, is it a lawful regime, is the key question. And Leviathan answers, yes, it's a lawful regime, because it's protecting you. Thank you for Annabelle Brett, David Wooden and Quentin Skinner. Well, next week we're talking about artificial intelligence. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.